Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. Disneyland. Just go to Action Park, there's no other park like it. Six Flags Great Adventure. It's not a world away. Paramount's Kings Island. We will officially open Universal Studios Florida. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. Now, here is your host. Welcome back to the Defunct Land Podcast. My name is Kevin Perger. Today, I am joined by Brian Krosnick. Did I pronounce that correctly? You did, yes. Yes, I did. Um, that's this, this whole season of podcast guests, Just Get Ready, is going to be me um, asking them if I pronounce their names correctly, <laughs> um, because I'm awful at it, as I've always <laughs> said. But um, today, I'm really excited because Brian's agreed to join me, and Brian is both my major inspiration, and he doesn't even know this, for Defunct Land, um, and he helps greatly through his great research. Um, Brian, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, that's amazing, first of all, um, but I am really interested in attraction history, as I know all of us are, so I, many years ago, started a series that is basically doing exactly what you're doing, uh, just in writing, um, on Theme Park Tourist. So it's been a really awesome way to tell the really in-depth stories that start, you know, decades before an attraction even opens and, you know, certainly decades before it closes. So, Yeah, and that is the um, Lost Legends series, correct? That's right, yeah. And you also write another series called Disaster Files. I do, yeah. I mean, we started a couple of in-depth series going over different things. So the Disaster Files is one. Um, we've kind of started this new one, Modern Marvels, to get a chance to dig into the history of some, I guess you'd call them current classics. So uh, yeah, we're really trying to tell as many stories as we can in that really, really cool way of just digging deep. Absolutely. And well, to kind of explain how, um, kind of how Defunct Land started, the video series is I was um, and I mentioned this in the Future of the Defunct Line podcast a few episodes ago, um, or I guess that was last episode, is that um, I watched Bright Sun Films, and I loved his work, um, and he, uh, Jake, and their team eventually just moved on to just abandon stuff, but they originally started doing more amusement park stuff, and I realized I really liked the, the you know, the attraction base, the dark ride, the specifications, just the ride. I didn't care about the decaying remains or anything like that. What I really cared about was the the ride mechanics and the layouts and and the the special effects and stuff like that stuff that Bright Sun Films audience um, that's not what his audience is and I was I was wondering maybe there's an audience out there for this and I started looking up some old attractions the first one that caught my eye is uh, the first one that I think ca- catches everybody's eye is extraterrestrial alien encounter absolutely that's the first one I did so we're oh on is the it same boat yep there we go um because that one just well first of all the 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 title just pops because it's so weird and awkward and very 1994 extra terror estrial yes. it's it's a stupid name <laughs> but we're used to it so no one ever talks about how dumb it is um but it, I, but whatever and right. so i saw this and i <laughs> theme park tourist and you know there's a bunch of theme park sites and they all have similar esque names um but theme park tours definitely goes the furthest in depth and actually tell stories and stays away from rumors and if there is a rumor they say it. it's it's actual journalism in the theme park industry not to say that other websites don't do this but theme park tourists is definitely uh, the either the best or in the best in the theme park um, journalism realm and I found Brian's article on extraterrestrial and it was like five pages long yeah it's ridiculous and the pages <laughs> <laughs> yeah the pages weren't that short and I just thought wow there is so much information on these rides and so I started um, looking into them. And so um, we can start off, we can go down the line here. Oh, well, first, sorry, let me let me back up. Um, I'm everywhere. I'm really excited. Um, me too. <laughs> good, good. I hope the audience is excited too. Um, <laughs> and so t- talk to me about Theme Park Tourist. How did you get started with it? Is it something that you co-own, that you partly own, or is it just, you're just a writer? Uh, what's your relationship with the website? That's a great question. So um, it- when I came on board at that website, which was probably six and a half years ago, which seems incredible to me, um, it's actually, it was owned by a guy named Nick Sim. Uh, he passed away recently. His wife is now running the site, which is phenomenal. Um, and at the time, I think 
he and I, as sort of an early writer, were thinking we would just do what everyone else was doing, which was listicles, you know, uh, top 10 things you can't miss at the Coronado Springs and that sort of thing. Uh, and we definitely started that way and uh, started talking. We, 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 at that time, we're doing a lot with regional parks as well. And I would say our big break into this like long form sort of style was actually that I kind of went out on a limb and was like, can I do this piece I've been thinking about, about Geauga Lake? Um, I'm from Ohio. Some listeners out there may be very aware of Geauga Lake or have some idea of what it was. Very strange story of a full-sized amusement park with roller coasters and thrill rides built on the edge of a lake. On the other side of the lake was a full-sized SeaWorld, like official SeaWorld Shamu and all here in Ohio. And uh, at some point, Six Flags purchased one and then purchased the other and just built a bridge between them. So it was like a 700-acre giant world's largest amusement park with whales and roller coasters, and it was insane. Uh, And, of course, five years later, it was gone. It just doesn't exist anymore. It's just uh, an empty field. So... I asked if I could do this sort of deep dive on this story, and it was very well received, especially in the area, and started looking at, can we shift to a model of being a little bit more intentional and thoughtful about telling these in-depth stories and getting all the details right and the, the photographs and the concept art and the why and what happened before, um, And so that's when, you know, you go to Lost Rides, Lost Attractions, and as you said, first one has to be Alien Encounter. Um, So, you know, wrote that, and, and kind of between those two, I think he and I were able to go, yeah, there's a market for this, and people want to hear these stories. And, you know, the details are out there, but they're never in the right place at the right time altogether. Uh, And I think that's what you and I do really well, I hope, is uh, tell that complete story beginning to end and get all the details into one piece. Absolutely. And uh, luckily, you've you've had some time to do this. You've been doing this for years now. Yeah. Um, And I've just been doing it for less than a year. It'll be about a year when the first episode of season two comes out because I released Alien Encounter on February 15th 22nd oh, something that's amazing like that. congratulations oh thank you it's my it's my <laughs> year anniversary yeah party <laughs> it's like a, it's like a kevin's birthday celebration like uh, mickey's had it <laughs> it's gonna we're just gonna, exactly we're right. gonna do it for five years yes um or however long that was <laughs> um no but the uh so i it's really nice because you've done the work and then what I do is I read the article, do my best to not plagiarize, and then everywhere that I see something, I'm like, I want to know more about that. Then I go and, you know, I d- dig through the message boards and I do this and that. And But it's nice to have that, you know, story that you have already laid out um, as a good foundation. And then, you know, uh, the fact that I'm doing a, a video with it, of course, adds videos and pictures add uh, so much more, you know, Oh, not work, but what's the word? Uh, it's just a different, you're right, it's a different medium. Yeah, absolutely. Like, finding the video on some of this stuff, which the attraction we're going to be talking about today, because we're eventually going to get into the post-episode discussion of Tomb Raider. Um, for instance, you wrote this big, long thing on your article saying, uh, there's not a lot of great videos for Tomb Raider. Right. And Which is fine, because you're writing an article, but for me, I'm like, there's not a lot of good videos of Tomb Raider. Yes. <laughs> and and it's, very, it's very, you know, troubling. Right. And, um... So it's just, it's kind of, it's hard to translate sometimes, but man, is that foundation helpful. And it, it turns out that there's been a, a lot of attractions that you've covered that I've covered. And I think you've maybe done one or two after me. Um, just maybe, I don't know how many, have you, you, you did, was Back to the Future already up there before I did it? You know, I don't know. When did you do Back to the Future? Oh, let's think. I mean, that was probably four months ago. Yep. So back to the future. My video was already up. So that makes me, I may, whether you watched it or not, it just, uh, I beat you to the punch on back to the future. And that makes me feel good on the inside for some reason. Well, no, you know what? I think it's great because you and I are telling the same story in our own way and it's, it's a different medium, but it's also, you know, you can approach these stories from so many angles. Are we going to talk about the storyline and how it fits into the land? Or are we going to talk about the technology that came before? I mean, and, and I think, 
they're complements, if anything, and that to get the full picture, you'd want both. Yeah, absolutely, and that's and that's one thing uh, that I that I've differentiated myself, uh, and it took me some time to find out because on your videos, on your sorry, sorry, when your articles, they're very um, broad scope in that you what you do really well is you have this attraction, you have its history, but in the last page or at the start of the, at the beginning, first page, there's this broader scope of what's going on in the theme park industry and um, how this single ride affected not just this park and not just this company, but the industry as a whole. And that's what um, is harder to do in video, but you do so well in the articles, which is why I recommend everyone to read those articles um, because you get, you know, more in depth on theme park history as a whole. Thank you. I mean, I, at this point, I feel like like 80% of the stories start with, once again, we're in Tomorrowland 1955. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, or it's, the year is 1992, three or four. Yes. Yep. Like that is, that's usually when things start. Everything changed. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everything <laughs> changed because, uh, from, I don't know, from an economic standpoint, everything was going pretty well. Mm. Or may, did we just get, what was the 90s recession? It wasn't, you know, nearly as big. Right. And then everything gets depressing around 2008 and 2009 for some reason. Yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, so today, um, since this is the first episode, podcast episode of season two, um, I want to go through every single, it's going to be very painful, oh, every ready. single episode. <laughs> um, and if you've done, if you've done an article on it, I want you to tell me some stuff about your research or about the article, um, or just thoughts on the attraction. And if you haven't, I want to hear why you haven't done an article on it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, if you are going to and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I guess we should just get started with episode one, Extraterrestrial. Um, when you started this one, this was, of course, your first one. What was it like getting started on writing uh, for this type of uh, this type of article? I'm being very redundant. I'm sorry. No. Um, so I guess I'm going to be very honest with you here. This is going to be the world premiere of this information. I never experienced it in person. So you heard it here first. Um, <laughs> I was born in 1991 and I was terrified of everything. <laughs> so, uh, I did not actually experience the extraterrestrial alien encounter. So f to start this story, which I knew is like the story, I guess was a little bit maybe personal because it's like, I have to know what I missed. Right. Um, I feel like s the allure of alien encounter was... The idea of this, like, obscenely horrific attraction in the middle of Magic Kingdom, which, like I point out in the article, has nothing else in the way of, like, what you would call PG-13. Uh, you know, at least at Disneyland, you've got Star Tours and you've got Indiana Jones Adventure and things that are, like, you know, a little darker uh, and placed in the middle of Magic Kingdom. This thing is just, like what was it doing there? Who thought it was a good idea to put it there? It's so uneven with everything else. And then just what is it? Because even if you've heard about it, you know, people say oh, you're in the dark and uh, an alien attacks you and nobody really, you can't picture if you don't know what you're talking about, what people mean by that. So I just started with research and I guess, again, the story begins in Tomorrowland 1955, but like, I uh, was just super enthralled with the idea of the world building, not only inside Alien Encounter, but around it. So I just wanted to learn as much as I could about that new Tomorrowland 1994 that, you know, some people detest, but I think is such a cool idea in its original incarnation. No, it's it's the best. I, I stand by that Tomorrowland 1994 was the best Tomorrowland. Um, and, and that's, and I, that's my opinion because I love creativity and I love different and I love being bold and it was all of those things. And it was so well themed. Um, just the, the, hor the horror of extraterrestrial alien encounter made it stand out and made it feel a little bit out of place, but timekeeper was not a jolly attraction. Right. Um, it, it was, it wasn't sinister, but I mean, it, it felt greasy, I guess is the my best adjective. Yeah. Um, and so did um, oh, what else was there at this time? Uh, well, wait, when did Buzz Lightyear get there? So was was Delta Dreamflight still there? Yeah, it would have been, which would have been 
I, out of place. That whole sort of back half of the land, you know, despite a few giant cogs and gears, <laughs> right. was really still 1975 Tomorrowland. Take it or leave it, <laughs> but like that the people mover being absorbed into that storyline, the the astro orbiter being absorbed and even Space Mountain. Um, you know, I don't know that they've done anything quite that ambitious with world building within a single land um, in terms of t- bringing all these disconnected things and putting them together. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I just, I loved Tomorrowland 1994. I loved the idea of extraterrestrial, and I'm also a huge Timekeeper fan, but I, I feel like I'm alone. But every time I say that, people say, no, you know, you're not, but I love Timekeeper. Have you done an article yeah. on Timekeeper? No, uh, but it is on my roster for this month. Oh, boy. So February, yeah. Oh, good. That'll make that video easier. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) um, I don't know if I'm doing a video because I'm writing a book right now on uh, the Defunct Land Guide to the Magic Kingdom, and I go step by step and take you through every single extinct attraction in the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World. Um, and so it'd be kind of redundant to have a video when I have, I do, I did write a bunch on timekeeper and I, I just, oh, it's, I, I love the idea of it Yeah. or whatever the, the French name of it is. Le Visionarium. I, I can't even, <laughs> Le Visionarium. Like yeah. Sure. I don't speak French. Um, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I'm interested in, if you ever want to start a new series or just talk about maybe, I don't know if you've done a lost legend on just the 1994 concept mm-hmm. alone. Have you done that? No. And I think maybe Timekeeper will get into that. Yeah, because there is, I mean, you're going to start in Paris, obviously, with Timekeeper. Right. Um, it, yeah, but it did, it premiered in Paris in 92, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm trying, yeah, okay. Um, when the park opened. And so, yeah, if you could, maybe, I don't know, and this is just, this is what I would love to see. There are so many weird things around Tomorrowland Mm -hmm. that got put in I think in 1994 or for that eventually that is just I I don't know what they are and why they're there and I want to know more about them you know there's the newspaper guy right um I don't know when that was put in (laughs) I don't either um oh there's some other stuff I keep forgetting there's a there's some weird things around Tomorrowland yeah and I for and I of course I'm blanking on all of them but I there was just some weird decorations they just added and it's interesting I would like to know right. more about those well and actually i mean t- changing the topic for 30 seconds one of those modern marvels in-depth things i just did was actually on tron light cycle power run and obviously talks about eventually it coming to magic kingdom which is now official um but just how is it good or is it bad that they're taking this new vision of tomorrow that they made for shanghai where it's glass and it's sleek and it's curves and just kind of plopping it for lack of a better word into magic kingdoms Tomorrowland. so you'll have this the sci-fi art deco industrial entrance and then you'll have your 70s concrete back half and then just this kind of strange curving glass canopy over you know the gas guzzling uh, speedway. So it's kind of interesting to see how that look has held up and how it may or may not change. Yeah, it's bad. Um, I, I don't, I don't like it at all. Um, it's, it's like they don't even learn from their mistakes. Are, are the, is the current man- management that is not the Imagineers, obviously, but the people that are demanding the, this ride be placed here and whatever. Um, do these people even realize the Tomorrowland problem that if you keep I mean, that Tron Light Cycle is a beautiful ride, but it looks like a architecture MFA's thesis project. Yeah. I, I mean, it looks like you could plop that down in the middle of New York right now, and it would it would look just fine. That's not tomorrow. Like a train station or something. Yeah, yeah. or like an opera house or something. Yep. Um, something or an art building or museum. It just it looks very modern. Yeah. But Tomorrowland's about tomorrow, and... 1994 did that so well, and it was like, it's the tomorrow that never happened. And the same with, um, what is it, Discovery Land in Paris. And they, fi- they they like realized, oh, we don't have to keep changing this if we just make it the future of the past, like a future that is impossible and we'll never get there. We'll never have to change it. Um, and so we don't have to worry about trying to guess technological advancements. Um, That's exactly right. Which has always been something that I've never really 
uh, loved when people try to let's guess the future. Right. Um, because uh, if you ever listen to Bob Gale, who co-wrote Back to the Future, um, uh, he talks about how everyone he hates how everyone says like, "Oh, you predicted the future. How did you know?" And blah, blah, this, this, and this. And he said, "Oh, we weren't trying to predict the future. We were just putting in cool stuff that we thought may or may not happen. We didn't care. Right. Like fly, flying cars. Who cares? You know, just it, it just it looks cool and." That's, I'm definitely one of those people that it looks cool. It doesn't matter if this is the actual future, as you know, in it's not 1955. Right. And, and any time that you set out to actually try to create that future, inevitably there's going to become a place where it's just too close to today. Or maybe, as we've seen with some Tomorrowland versions, that it goes for so long that it becomes yesterday (laughs) but it just cannot possibly stay futuristic for long unless you commit to being like i don't care what the real future holds we're just gonna go for this and we're gonna imagine some crazy ridiculous in the case of disney parks they go to a retro future like what did people in the 1940s think the future would look like well let's build it yeah i would even i like remake Walt's Tomorrow like the, it's it's Walt Disney's Tomorrowland and you can even brand it like mm-hmm. that you know they brand everything make it Walt Disney's Tomorrowland and this is what Walt thought the future was going to be like and this is I mean it looks very antiquated and very you know white and very you know uh, uh, what's the word flat yeah and that's fine though that's cool I mean you don't have to change Space Mountain because it already looks like that right um, you just have to change all the buildings kind of back to how they originally were I don't know just I was fa- also fine with the IP editions in Tomorrowland. One of the few times that, I mean, uh, not Stitch, but if you're gonna get rid of two great attractions, then at least you made them. Con- it, well, if you count De- Delta Dream Flight, um, those three attractions were replaced all with cartoonish, uh, kind of monster spacey, uh, like you know, fantasy IPs that still felt very you know cool and they're very blue and. Um, you know, very futuristic esque. Even though you know, Stitch isn't the future, and um, Buzz Lightyear is in space, not really the future. And you know, Monsters Inc. Ha- Never mind. None of these things have to do with the yeah. future. <laughs> but they, they they at least were consistent. And you know, that's Monsters Inc. That's Buzz Lightyear, and that is Stitch. At least those three animated properties just felt kind of you know coherent. I don't know what they're gonna do when they close Stitch. Uh, Wreck-It Ralph, I guess that's coherent. Uh, Yeah, I mean, and I think what's happened in Magic Kingdom is the same thing that's happened in Paris, where what you end up with is sort of this gilded shell. So it's like someone a few decades ago spent a whole lot of time designing this physical environment to tell a story actively or passively, but like this is a vision of the future rooted in a certain time and mindset and style and uh, like take, you know, discovery land, not to get too off base, but in Paris, it's this golden, beautiful seaside vision of the future, like HG Wells or Jules Verne would have imagined it. You've that that's where you've got the rocks erupting from the ground and lagoons and waterfalls. And then, you know, you go on Buzz Lightyear. And it's like, well, that doesn't even connect to this idea of a European fantasy future. Or now they've got, of course, one of the Lost Legends that I did is on um, Paris's Space Mountain, which was just completely different from the rest. And it was based off the Jules Verne novel From the Earth to the Moon. And, you know, there's like uh, all these French accents and cinematic theatrical things to make it a fantasy trip through the stars and now it's star wars hyperspace mountain you know for the foreseeable future and it's in this beautiful gold mountain covered in rivets and brass and oxidized copper and you know you're you're fighting the empire so uh you know i think tomorrowland is such a weird thing to to talk about because what should it be? What shouldn't it be? How do you create a vision of tomorrow that is timeless, that maybe doesn't rely on Pixar? <laughs> it's it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, and I hope they do it, but until then, it's just going to be a point. They're just going to keep throwing IPs in it I, as long as Iger's there, unless some 
and who who knows who's going to replace Iger and it might get even more random. And as I've always said, if you're going to Guardians of the Galaxy and California Adventure instead of Tower of the T- Tower of Terror, I don't care that people love it. Um, I attribute it, and when I in the book I'm writing, I just attributed it to if you gave Steven Spielberg a really bad movie idea, he would make it a good movie and you'd be impressed. But that doesn't mean that you should give him a bad idea. That's how I feel with the Imagineers. If you give them a bad idea, like, hey, put Guardians of the Galaxy in this drop tower, they're going to amaze you and it's going to be a great ride, but that doesn't mean it was the best starting point. Yes. Um, and that is how I think it's going to be for the foreseeable future, at least, in Tomorrowland and everywhere else, which is, which is very unfortunate. But if they're going to do something weird... Uh, Make it weird, weird. I mean, like I talked about on another podcast, George of the Jungle Cruise. <laughs> like, bring back Brendan Fraser as an animatronic. I don't care. Just, if you're going to do something weird, just make it really weird. I want it to be the most bizarre park I've ever been in. And just just ruin everything <laughs> and make it co- make it consistent by just ruining everything. There you go. I just want consistency. I just want theming. The theme is it's bad. Welcome <laughs> yeah. to, that's the theme. Right. And you can change the Mickey costume to be frowning all the time, or just have one single <laughs> tear. This sounds um, like that okay. Banksy theme park. Didn't he do that? Yeah, he did. Um, what was it called? It was Dismaland. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sure. Um, so let's move on. Oh, we spent like tw- thirty minutes on <laughs> Alien Encounter. We have Sorry. no. It's no. It's the <laughs> best one. Ouch. Um, I literally just fell in my chair because I'm <laughs> I'm incompetent. Um, but let's move on to Videopolis. Uh, where's the Videopolis article? Uh, you know what? I I don't think there will ever be one. What? Because I don't know how much you can say about Videopolis on its own in my without relying too much on multimedia. Um, eight minutes. I yeah well <laughs> eight, eight minutes worth. There you go. Um, I feel like it is wrapped into uh, so many stories because it is that living evidence of a big change in thinking uh, that came about with Michael Eisner. Um, but, you know, I think leave it in video form. That's where that story should be told. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know. There's a lot of interesting stuff with it. I don't know if you've seen the video mm-hmm. um, for Videopolis, but there's a... Uh, you got the gang fights. Yes. Um, you have... They invented the churro, which I don't even think I mentioned. Uh, they didn't invent the churro. Sorry, they brought the churro to Disneyland. They, that was their big thing. Uh-huh. Um, they had uh, what else? Like this was Michael Eisner's first project. It was like in 1985, I believe, or something, mm-hmm. or one of his first projects. Yeah. Um, like wrote it on a napkin or something. I, f- I forget the details. Um, and oh no, there's just there's a lot of weird. So, oh, the the homosexual fast dancing, <laughs> um, as Disney called it. <laughs> Which is just bizarre and That's weird. very bizarre. Yeah, see, I have not done any of this research, so this is all new to me. Oh, see, there's so many things. You, I mean, one of Disney, Disney's gang fight in the parking lot because of Idiopolis, and you got uh, tons of stuff. Yeah, I mean, and this was his, in a sense, get-rich-quick scheme. He wanted Disney parks to be hip and happening. He wanted the teens there. You know, he wanted to be the cool dad of the company who was going to bring all these young people and everyone was going to love it. And it was like... It's all Breck's fault. Yes, it is. (laughs) Uh, And it was like, what can we do fast? And, you know, that was pretty fast. Yeah, it was the fastest project ever completed, I believe. Right. Um, Because it was nothing. It was like 12 months from design to opening or something. When I... Yeah, it was very short. And when I was looking at, you know, I did this episode recently, um, or an extras, a bonus footage, where I took all of this footage. I found Regis at uh, Alien Encounter, all this footage I didn't find originally, and just put it together. And uh, my thing I found for Videopolis was Goofy. Uh, the, they used to have Disneyland, the State Fairs of California, or something. Uh-huh. Disneyland, or something like that. A fair of some kind. And um, Goofy was riding a BMX bike to Devil Went Down to Georgia. I mean, that is it in a nutshell, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, I think we can move on. I don't think you can top that. Um, Jaws. Jaws. The ride. Yeah, Jaws is, uh, I mean, to this day, as I told you, I was what you would call an excitable young child. (laughs) And, uh, you know, was horrified of Jaws. I very distinctly remember my parents taking me to Universal Studios in the early days when you had Jaws and and all those others, and I'm sure there's another we'll talk about. 
Um, but I faked a stomach ache to be like, I cannot do this anymore. <laughs> like, you don't have the words to express that to your parents. So they like took me to the first aid at Universal Studios. But it's because of Jaws. I mean, horrific. And I think to this day, you know, if that were still there or, you know, since it is at Universal Studios Japan, I mean, it's just such a scary, but now as an adult, a fun, scary experience. Uh, and the way they hide those animatronic sharks in that water, I don't know, masterful. Yeah. I mean, it took them a few tries, but they yes. got, they've yeah. got it. Um, oh, yeah. Now, Jaws is such a it's, a, it's a crazy story, of course. It's the big, uh, f- you know, because there was orig- the original one, and then they, you know, that was the big story of Universal that people, you know, go to a lot is, oh, Jaws was messed up. Right. Um, I think the real story is that guy that fell in. Um, you know, that did, did you hear about, did you write about that, the guy that fell in the water? I didn't write about it, but I did hear it's uh, people didn't think it was real. Um, people for years, I guess, or on the theme park community online on message boards always said that's a rumor. That's a rumor. Then I found one message boards where I was like, no, it's not. And they put a newspaper article where they had the quotes from the guy and it was real. And I was like, oh my, um, guy fell in the water and thought and saw the shark coming at him. And <laughs> that that's more horrifying than a real shark, in my opinion. I think it is because it really will kill you yeah i mean it's, <laughs> without a it's, second it's thought. a real shark it's dying death by robo shark yes is much i mean that that's a sci-fi movie <laughs> if I, I i like sci-fi the channel not the yeah. genre if they haven't made it already so, that's what i was gonna say how does that not already exist it, it, it probably does honestly if i looked up a robo shark sci-fi right now do you think anything would come up more than likely someone has fought robo a robo shark. shark a giant octopus robo shark movie there you go yep Hey, I was right. Maybe, uh, maybe I was actually just referring to that without even realizing it. But it's real, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, do you have anything else on Jaws? I mean, yeah. If if, and I know all of your listeners will have watched your video of it. Such a crazy story. How, how wrong it went, and <laughs> how that still to this day remains what people want from Universal. Um, you know, I did sort of a listicle a while ago about the kinds of rides Universal needs to add if it is hoping to take on Disney. And and don't get me wrong, I'm a big Universal fan. I love Universal. Uh, you know, I love Islands of Adventure. Um, so I'm not at all saying, like, they're never going to beat Disney. Not that kind of thing. But uh, this sort of ride, this idea of just straight up, practical effects where you don't know what's going to happen uh like jaws is the living example of how animatronics can do something that a screen cannot yeah and universal's just screens now yeah and i get it i i mean i understand i mean they they don't bob gurr working i mean bob gurr helped on jaws did he helped on confrontation he did he help on jaws as well i don't know about jaws it's definitely kong and Peter Alexander was a major driving force. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you had these great, you know, minds starting out. And I don't, not that the people working there aren't geniuses now, but these, they're geniuses in probably different fields. They, and people forget that Disney has invented the animatronic in its current right. form. Um, literally invented the word from what I remember. Yep, absolutely. Um, and it's just, they've never gotten there. And, and it's impossible to compete with Disney animatronics. So they, so it makes sense from a business perspective to say, why are we even trying anymore? Yeah. Let's just get the, let's do screens and let's just become the best at simulators. And then, you know, Disney's like, ah, here's Pandora. Right. And then I was like, oh, okay, maybe we're not even the best at that. But it's the, from a business perspective, it makes sense to change, but the fatigue that has on the viewer. Oh, just like every single cue line. You're like, where do I pick up the glasses? Where are they? <laughs> I mean, even just it, let's just. I mean, the Universal board meetings just must be okay. So we're gonna open a new attraction. How do we punch our guests in the face 
as hard as we can without them realizing it. Yes. Because there's like there's, they're, they they probably have like a timeline. Like okay, uh, pin, they spin the wheel and they find out okay, this attraction is going to be three minutes and t- t- thirty seconds. All right. Yep. Um, and let's just and at the one and a half minute mark, let's give them a little taste. It will just rock the car forward really hard. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even matter if it feels good or if it if it's believable or not. Just hurt them. Yep. And then a minute from then, then we're really going to hurt them. And when we do that, let's just blast fire at their face. Yes, and, it's just, and at some point you have to get sprayed with water. Yeah, no, but it's not a lot of water. It's just a little... Tss. Just it's enough like, to make you wince. It, yeah, it's like someone accidentally spit while they were speaking to you. <laughs> yes. That's what it feels like. It's awful. And and Universal and their obsession with fire. Yeah. Or their, I guess, I don't know if they're still obsessed with fire. I mean, the mummy is oh so hot. Very hot. Um, Confrontation was oh so hot, and Jaws was, um, like, it's literally burning my hair of my skin off hot. Um <laughs> But yeah, uh, Universal's got some things to figure. All theme parks right now have some things to figure out because it's a period of um, economic stability and yet like creative stagnation. Like yeah, there's gonna the, there's gonna be the next big thing in theme parks coming out in the next ten years, and I'm 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 leaning towards the Westworld esque idea. Right. Um. I don't know if your thoughts on that, but the the idea that it's gonna be completely immersive, it's gonna cost a lot more, it's gonna be ab- it's gonna be inclusive. And every, it's going to be a major role playing with attractions and everything, but it's not not no crowds. It you pay a thousand dollars and you get the park to you, and you know one tenth of the people to go to the Magic Kingdom, and that's your amusement for the day. Yeah, and I think any of us who have been to Disneyland any time in the last five years have gone. This place needs to cost a thousand dollars. Like even if it prices <laughs> me out, like we have to do something about this. Um, and you know, like, I feel like you kind of saw the start of that with Discovery Cove in Orlando and this idea of having a very high priced, low capacity park that's sort of like all inclusive day resort. And, and I'm sure you remember right about that time we were hearing that's what Disney wanted to do and they were going to call it Disney's night kingdom and it was only going to open at dusk and it was going to have animal encounters and, Um, that obviously never came about, but you wonder if maybe that was intentional and because they knew, let's give this a little time to mature and let's get the technology up to date so that we can have people's wristbands activating things like you see at Volcano Bay. So yeah, I I think that's definitely the next step. And, uh, at this point, I know a lot of people, when you end up at Disneyland or Disney World during the summer or whatever, you're going, okay, we need to eliminate annual passes completely. Just get rid of them. Can't have them. Maybe the the one that costs fourteen hundred dollars. That's the way a lot of people feel because it's it's they and of course the the limit they're going to set on attendance is going to be well above what you and I would find comfortable. So yeah, that new generation of immersive and I think that is what's next. Or you have you you expand your parks. Um, you make them bigger and you make the queues longer and you, I mean, there's some good examples of new attractions, you know, Mission Breakout and, um, Avatar and, oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, the Jimmy Fallon ride, oh. um, <laughs> where they've, they, they're, they're starting to innovate the queues, which is interesting, but you can't do that at Disneyland cause you don't have any space. Right. Um, especially cause you, you know, on a whim decide, let's just put Star Wars land over there. Yep. And then you're just like, the internet will, will justify it somehow. And that's, those are the comments I'm getting. Yeah. No, Kevin, it makes complete sense because no, it doesn't. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Star Wars. I don't want it to be a genre in movie form or attraction form, but it's just, I don't know. I, I agree. I don't want to take the magic away from the kids. And I think that's the only problem that I would have with increasing, uh, costly attendance because I know I grew up in the Midwest, um, and you know I, I when I went to Disney World it was a huge deal. I didn't even know there was such a thing as annual passes until a few years ago. Oh, absolutely, same. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, and it's gonna it's gonna make a lot of people mad, and Disney might come into legal trouble with you know the counties they're in and the cities they're in because. Um, oh, you're not letting our citizens go to the park whenever they want? And it's like, well, then you can't. You have to do this. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that could come with that. Right. But If only Disney Quest had worked out, then we wouldn't even have to go. We could just go downtown right. to our own local city. Yeah, where's Disney Quest? Yep. Where's the episode on Disney Quest? 
<laughs> but the um no no so yeah it's just I don't I want children to be able to experience Disney magic. Yep. And because that is very important. And as much as people some people like to be cynical and and I'm a cynic, but as people say, oh Disney, you know Disney's just a corporation. They're just out to make money. They have never just been out to make money until a couple years ago. But and the the parks are still run by people that want to create magic, you know, and they. They, they're, they're creating Magic Daily. The Imagineers, if any anybody really thinks that Disney World and Disneyland is just out to wring money out of people, that's the reason that it was made. I urge you to read any book by an Imagineer. Right. Um, a good one to start is Marty Scars. I'm in the middle of his right now. It's fantastic. Um, I don't know if you've read Dream It, Do It. I think that's the title. It is. It's sitting on my bookshelf right in front of me. Yep. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> Yeah, and it it's it just shows you that the, these people were, it's for the audience, it's not for just money, right? And but people that aren't creative and people that aren't in the that are just strictly in the business world to make profit, they they can't understand that concept. Um, so suck it, business people. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, <laughs> if if you like business, don't listen to this. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, anyways, what was I going? What's next? Um. Pretzel Dark Rides. Where's the Pretzel Dark Rides episode? You know, that's such a great question. Um, <laughs> or, sorry, article. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, listen, it should be coming, right? I mean, uh, I think that because Theme Park Tourist is very focused on Florida and, to a lesser extent, California, it hasn't happened yet. But I would really like to get into some of the classic dark rides. I mean, right here in the Midwest with me is like Noah's Ark at Kennywood, uh, a walk through and one of, I, I believe it's the only one remaining now that used to just be everywhere. So I would love to do something with classic dark rides in that style. Yep. Yeah. It's not that interesting. Um, I had trouble filling five minutes, so good luck writing an article on it. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. It's okay. Canceled it's canceled. It. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, the uh, <laughs> it's 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 a great little tiny story about this these uh, guys that started dark rides and changed the industry, but it it doesn't go on for very long as a problem. Um, so let's go on to the next one, and I've already forgotten what episode six of Defunct Land is. Um, I'm literally typing in the website right now and I'm <laughs> drawing out my syllables so I can look it up. It's Pleasure Island. Oh, Pleasure Island. That's great. You beat me there again because just a few days ago, uh, my article on the Adventurers Club just came out. Oh, did it? Yes. Um, Pleasure Island, I will say, I'm going to correct my earlier statement about New Tomorrowland at Magic Kingdom and say, I think Pleasure Island is the most robust world building that Imagineering has done. Um, but, and I think Imagineers themselves basically admit to this, it was too much and it was too embedded that no one would even really notice unless you were looking for it. Um, but the the detail and the story that went in behind the scenes to explain away warehouses and, you know, the Adventurers Club and a mansion, a Bermuda-style mansion on the edge of the lake. I mean, really, really incredible. Yeah, it's it's all very genius and there's so much creativity and put into it. And to point out the statement I just made about Disney not in to make money, that added nothing to the attendance. Right. Um, that was pure creativity, just th- vomited all over that small patch of land with all those nightclubs. Um, but yeah, it's it was such a weird. It's so weird. It's it's weird. It's just so, I and, and people in the comments get mad at me when I say um, it's it, a good reason is not that it's weird. I don't. I kind of think it is. I think it's just weird. I don't know what you think about the whole idea, like implementation and like everything. The story is really interesting. I love the Adventurers Club story, and um, I love all the, all that stuff. But just why wow, Disney Downtown Disney? Yeah, and and in my head, I mean, the Adventurers Club itself is obviously this like wild experiment in immersive theater, which now you know we have at our local escape room 
or you see these really, really grand ones that are in New York or Los Angeles where it's a whole night and you have free reign of this beautiful place and there's actors and they take you away from your group and take you... I mean, that now is this emerging, awesome kind of theatrical experience. Uh, the Adventures Club did that, and I think if you zoom out, Pleasure Island did that too in a sense where if you were so inclined which would only be people like you and I and everyone listening right now, you could spend an evening exploring that island, maybe not even go into a club, and kind of feel like you were solving a mystery or, or figuring out a story. You know, you're looking for plaques that show when buildings were founded, and you're looking for all these details that were so embedded. I mean, it, it's almost like that entire Pleasure Island was this living theater experience that you and I could walk through, which is so cool. Yeah, and such a horrible place to put it. Absolutely. And yes. no one, and or, and you know, because who are you going to draw? Um, tourists? Where are the kids? In the hotel room? That's right. Uh, I mean, you would have to draw a lot of Orlando, and I mean, oh, thank gosh you have a lot of annual pass holders that would be willing to go to this. Yeah. But also, Orlando's nightclub scene at the time was, you know, uh, going way up. And yeah, and in true was... Eisner fashion, that was the point, was, well, they've got Church Street Station, we're going to build Pleasure Island. They've got Bush Gardens, well, we don't want people to go to Bush Gardens, we're going to build Animal Kingdom. People come to Disneyland, but then they go see the rest of California. Fine, we're going to bring the rest of California to Disneyland, right? Right. And in, in that way, you know, he was looking, we're going to make a lot of money, but he was greenlighting all of this creative, you know, ambitious projects and just giving such a blank slate to these Imagineers that he would then go and look over their shoulders they drew, but what you know, what, what can you do? You can't have everything. Right. Um, so let's go on to Confrontation. We talked a little bit about this. Do you have anything to add on Confrontation? I mean, the recurring story of the animatronics, I just think it, I've heard it summed up really well, which is what Universal started doing um, is being much more literal about bringing movies to life and by movies for example think of harry potter they mean the movie harry potter with rupert grint and you know uh well i can't think of anybody else's name that's weird daniel, daniel radcliffe, radcliffe and <laughs> emma watson yeah. did you just name the one for that some people reason probably... <laughs> <laughs> are you are you are you on team rupert you know i guess subconsciously i am <laughs> but um and so I understand the argument is if you're bringing the movie Harry Potter to life and I get on a ride, to be very honest with you, I probably do want to see uh, Emma Watson and Rupert Grint and Daniel Radcliffe. I, I probably don't want to see Universal's best impression of an animatronic of them, right? If we're going to be flying around with Harry Potter... We're, we need Daniel Radcliffe on board, and we need to film it. Uh, so I totally understand that, and I think Disney does too, which is why there is no animatronic in Tron Light Cycle Power Run. There's no animatronic in, well, I guess there's one in Guardians of the Galaxy. But they're kind of coming onto this thing of like, oh, if we're just going to bring a movie to life... I mean, we need to get the stars together that filmed it, and we need to film something new and then put 3D glasses on. So, you know, I guess the only thing I'd say about Confrontation is total, fantastic, classic, shaped a generation of Florida visitors, incredible engineering masterpiece. I like The Mummy better, and I'll say it. Oh, Okay. Um, the mu yeah, that's going to throw a wrench into your plans, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the, the Mummy is great. I love The Mummy. It's a fun ride. Um, the, the I wish the fake ending was a little more elaborate. Yes. Um, I wish it was, It's you know, hearing about it beforehand, and yeah, it, it would not have fooled me right. even to begin right. with. Um, but no, The Mummy is very good and, I mean, burns your face yes. off. It um, is a universal but ride. But I will say... One, the mummy is also a good example. I be, is Brendan Fraser still at the end? Yes. 
Okay. This is a good example of how whenever you – and th this is – we've never gotten to this point yet because we've never – think to your simulators, right? Think about all these – the simulators that we've seen mm -hmm. um, before. We've seen Star Tours. That did not have one actor from Star Wars in it. Right. You think of Back to the Future. Okay, you have Doc Brown and Biff, but those are kind of ingrained in popular culture. Doc Brown's kind of a forever old anyways. Yes. Um, and Biff is from the movie. Even, But if you even if you went today, it would be weird to kind of see Biff. Yes. Beca but – Biff, the actor that played Biff, sorry if you're listening, but you didn't really have much of a career afterwards. Um, so it's not like, oh, look how young Biff is here, because we, I don't even know what Biff looks like now. Right. Um, but it's more, we, what's, well, and I've said this on a different podcast, and people did not, I don't think they agreed with me, but what's it going to be like in 10 years when we see Chris Pratt, 30 year old Chris Pratt? in that Guardians of the Galaxy right. Well, that's exactly right. And that's an argument that I make in my Lost Legends entry on Tower of Terror. Uh, say what you will, and, uh, you know, we've talked about it here. Obviously, Guardians of the Galaxy is fun. I'm not going to go ride it and look all sullen afterwards. I mean, it's a good <laughs> ride. Like, it's fun. People are going to cheer and laugh. But I want that. But I want that picture of you on the ride, your arms <laughs> crossed, and yes. you're just frowning. Harumph. <laughs> um, but not only do I not think Guardians of the Galaxy will be in popular culture in 20 years, but if it is, it'll be a reboot with different actors and, you know, different... Uh, and I guess The Mummy and Guardians of the Galaxy and all stemming from confrontation, excuse me, confrontation comes to the same conclusion, which is that really with this whole chasing the movies thing that Universal started and Disney is now doing, I don't really think anyone at Disney even thinks that Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout will still be at California Adventure in 20 years. I, I mean, it's not made for that. And it's the same with Race Through New York with Jimmy Fallon. It's the same with Fast and the Furious. I think the, these rides are temporary by design and that everyone's like, well, you know, that's that's the price of chasing intellectual properties and flavor of the week stories is part of you in the back of your head has to go, yeah, Fast and the Furious is not going to be at Universal Studios in even 10 years. That'll be replaced with something else, you know, but, but f when you involve the stars like these rides do, and the best example is uh, Universe of Energy at Epcot, because you didn't even have actors playing roles you had Ellen DeGeneres and Bill Nye <laughs> and you don't have to there's no there's no uh pretending that that person that you're looking at on the screen is a character Ellen played years ago you look at that and you go that's not Ellen DeGeneres I know what she looks like and I know what Bill Nye looks like this was obviously filmed a very long time ago right right so that that's the example of seeing what happens when you let those movie-based or character-based or actor-based attractions go on a little too long. See also Captain EO, but at least it came back as a tribute and not a legitimate, like, look, here's Michael Jackson. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think the best example is go ride Men in Black Alien Attack. And at the end, there is a video of Will Smith from, like, 2000. Yeah. And it is jarring. It is it's the first of all that attraction is very barren and there's like nothing going on in it. Right. It it feel it feels very awkward and everything's clunky and plastic and weird. But then at the end you have Will Smith and I'm sure when you when you when they originally came out with that attraction people were like oh this is a great attraction you can shoot it's amazing. But no one thought hey I wonder in the year 2017 if it's going to be weird seeing Will Smith at 30 <laughs> years old when we've watched Will Smith in a thousand movies after this. Right. And it is weird. You know, you got Will. Yeah. He's a. I mean, Will Smith's doing his normal Fresh Prince, still like half men and by. But now we've seen him in all these serious movies. We've. We, he's now a serious actor, and it's it's very odd to see him as his. You know. You know, young like, uh, and well, full of energy self, and it's just right. Weird, but that's our. I guess that's our little rant on the problem that these are. Fit. I mean, if that's the design, I guess spend the money. I mean, it's just that they. I don't know. They 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 plan these attractions so elaborately 
there's so much within Mission Breakout that would be hard to just say, okay, let's just change the screen. You have to change so much. Right. Um, and same with a lot of these other rides. Um, but a good example, and we're going to get to it, is the Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera. Yeah. But we're going to get to that. Okay. Um, so next is Superstar Limo. We got to be quick because we're we're going we're um, let's just let's just say a few things and then if we if we hit one that's like big we'll talk about it. Uh, so Superstar Limo. Superstar Limo is just everything that was wrong with California Adventure in the beginning. Lasted one year. Um, it was the epitome of that end of Eisner's reign where he's trying to get on board as many C list ABC stars as he can. Um, again, nothing about that ride could have lasted. I mean, it only lasted a year. It couldn't have lasted much longer because, you know, nobody cares to visit Regis Philbin, uh, or Whoopi Goldberg, you know, on a ride through Hollywood filled with inside jokes. And, uh, that, that one was truly a disaster. Yeah, that was just the probably the biggest theme park disaster of all time. Yeah, I, I mean, as far as Disney goes. Yeah, um, Son of Beast might top it, but we'll get to that. Yeah, um, Back to the Future, the ride. I mean, Back to the Future is, you know, according to everyone who was a part of it, is the reason Universal Studios Florida exists. It's like if we want to take on Disney, we need something to justify that. Uh, Star Tours was brand new at the time. There was a little bit of uh, elbowing between George Lucas and Steven Spielberg saying, you know, Universal could never do something like this. Uh, You know, the end result is just such a fantastic ride. Um, And that, I think, is probably... It's so hard because that is the trifecta of Universal what I call lost legends right there, Jaws, Confrontation, and Back to the Future. It just feels like it was this trilogy of super well-done headlining e-ticket attractions that anchored that park. And, you know, uh, taking a step back, you can look at each one and and wonder if what replaced it is, is worth the loss and people will debate forever even about, you know, Harry Potter replacing Jaws. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who think Jaws was the better fit for that park, and, and, you know, they're not wrong, they're not right. So, yeah, Back to the Future is a really, really cool attraction. I agree. Um, I I don't have much to say on it. I I talked about it a lot, but um, it's a great ride. And it's it is better than The Simpsons. I'm sorry. I agree. Um, Twenty thousand leagues under the sea and submarine voyage. I mean, this one is. I think for a a, a generation of Walt Disney World visitors, this ride was like a masterpiece. Now, you got your YouTube comments. I have my Facebook comments. <laughs> and and I try sometimes to just avert my eyes because, you know, plenty of people think that this was a totally boring ride, whatever. Um, the thing I love so much about it is the way it took Disneyland's submarine ride. It's in Tomorrowland. It's these military gray subs. You're on a research expedition because when those debuted in 1959 as, you know, the first e-ticket attraction like the e-ticket was created for the subs the monorail and uh matterhorn that all opened the same day i mean to take that idea to zoom forward to magic kingdom and to have the people at the helm there go submarines aren't the future anymore they don't belong in Tomorrowland. We need to take this awesome, fantastic concept, but we need to update it. And Submarine Voyage is where Tony Baxter enters the picture, one of many people of that era, but such a such an industry shaping figure. And you know, we make the case all the time. He represents this new generation of Imagineers. The first time that the people designing building, fabricating these attractions weren't just, you know, frankly, the old white men who had built the place to begin with. They were people who had been there as kids. 
you know, so Tony Baxter had been there as a guest. He grew up at Disneyland and he was able to come at things from a new point of view that those original designers just could never have. So to take that submarine voyage concept and go, let's put it in Fantasyland, let's make it the Nautilus, let's do Jules Verne, uh, is fantastic. And uh, one of my favorite little asides I've ever done is in that article for the Space Mountain that opened in Paris, where I just go through and list every time that Disney's Imagineers have tried to get Jules Verne into the parks. <laughs> time and time and time and time and time again. And every single time it closes, it's replaced. It gets kicked out for Star Wars. <laughs> so uh, that is this epitome of Imagineering in my mind of this changing time, this way of adapting a new story into an old ride a new generation of Imagineers trying to get this fantasy Jules Verne thing down. So I don't know, just totally a landmark attraction. Yeah. And the mind of Jules Verne was kind of adopted into Disney. Yeah. You know, it was adopted into the, into the Disney brand and, and that's, it's just so vast and so unique and it adds so much. And the best part is that Walt Disney himself wanted it there. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm not the diehard, what would Walt do, or if Walt wouldn't do that person. But when it comes to the brand, and when it comes to the the goals and the style, I think you got to kind of look at where it started, right. and kind of look at where things are going. And, you know, sure, change with the times, make things different, take risks. But, you know, you, you have this great property in Jules Verne, and you, you can base it off of that, and sure, that's not going to draw crowds. You can't make a commercial saying, from the mind of Jules Verne. Right. I mean, no one's going to go see that, but you have all these properties that it would be, fit so well into the parks, and they just they just can't do it because uh, there's always a, an IP that is more uh, is more sexy, I guess. And, and I've said before, like, y we all have to understand that, that Disney has spent billions and billions of dollars getting... Star Wars and Pixar and uh, the Muppets and I mean just you know they've acquired everything under the sun so maybe in that shareholder point of view you'd go wait a second you're building Mystic Manor at Disneyland you need to be building Marvel rides you know so yeah so I mean can't do it we can't do anything about it or can right. we or can we? Do let's start a let's start a petition. <laughs> I, I'm gonna start making T-shirts that say "Fix the Yeti," and that's gonna be the f if we can get the Yeti fixed. I think <laughs> we can convince them to stop buying major corporations. There you go. Although I'm, it's I'm, all connected. I'm fine. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> we just we start with Joe Rody and then we move our way up. Yep. Um, where am I? Um, America Sings. America Sings. Um, it was such a cool exception to the rule that we normally have about Tomorrowland. Well, the, with the rule that it has to be something even... I mean, it is the <laughs> most random thing you could have put yeah. in there. Yes. I mean, the most... I, I don't think of any... I can't think of anything more random. No. But it was this idea of the Carousel of Progress is moving out. General Electric wants it at Magic Kingdom because we've got international tourists. We've got groups coming in and out. You know, at Disneyland, Carousel of Progress, which I love. It's one of my favorite attractions of all time. Uh, but it's playing to the same audiences. The numbers are dwindling because Disneyland is so heavily local. These return guests who are here every couple weeks aren't going to keep seeing Carousel of Progress. Let's put it at Magic Kingdom, where, as has happened, it can play for decades to fresh guests all the time. Um, and then, so we've got this weird rotating theater and it's the bicentennial so let's make it a musical show about america <laughs> uh let's do it and let's have the snowman from rudolph sing all the songs yeah yeah and it worked so well yeah and uh it was a good attraction yes um, better than literally nothing or star wars launch what is it star wars launch bay yep I, oh, I, th I thought I was making that up halfway through, nope. so I stopped. Apparently, I, it was real. In my Modern Ooh. Marvel's Carousel of Progress article, I go through what happened to that building after America Sings moved out, which is, you know, as you said, 
nothing basically right well you got interventions for a bit yeah and then, which is yeah slightly above nothing slightly below nothing <laughs> it's hard to say it's kind of it kind of is nothing yeah um well, we got this interventions thing that everybody loves. Oh yeah, that, which is such a weird thing. That they do. <laughs> Anyways, um, Ghostbusters Spooktacular. Um, this one is. I think this is really honed in on like the core of what Universal Studios could do, and what Disney kind of tried to emulate with the Disney MGM Studios, which you know everyone says MGM Studios had no rides. True, it opened with two rides. But it's it did make up two, for it too. in show. It is <laughs> yes, uh, but made up for it in shows. And I think this that that Universal Studios had was like the the coolest kind of theme park show, where it's got a couple of inexplicable special effects, giant larger than life things, and it's just literally fun. Yeah, it's it's a great little story um i mean it's just it did its job it wasn't like you have to go see ghostbusters spooktacular right it wasn't like one of those things but i mean man it just it really was perfect for exactly what it was and it implemented a huge property so we'll just call this an episode actually and we'll come back on wednesday um with brian and we will talk all about um the all the rest of season one of defunct land and we'll get into the post episode discussion on tomb raider thank you for listening Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, and thank you for visiting Defunct Land.